It is my great and distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Baxter Montgomery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mason. Appreciate that. And thanks to all of you for staying. This has been a great uh, weekend. And I know it's been long, and uh, we'll try to bring it in. I don't have another 250 slides for the next three or four hours, so I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, now, anyway, what I want to talk to you about as we get into this is the food prescription approach to this. And you've heard a lot about the concepts, theory behind this, and the science, and we know this approach works. But, you know, if you are on 15, 20 medications, you have bad diabetes, you you, you've had five heart attacks and your heart's weak and your doctor's only giving you five months uh, or you have these serious problems, then what do you do? How do we apply this? And so what I want to do is go through the concept of this approach and how do we take this theory and apply it on a day-to-day -day basis. My day job, as Dr. Mason mentioned, clinical assistant professor, I work in uh, the Texas Medical Center in Houston. I'm a cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist. Uh, so by day, I guess I'm part of the problem uh, to some extent, but on weekends and evening times, I try to help people avoid my day services. And I think to the extent that we can help many Americans avoid these day services, uh, we're going to accomplish a lot. But I want to start off with a tale of two cities. Uh, there's a David versus Goliath concept. After that, we're going to talk about congestive heart failure. What is it? We're going to focus on that disease state. But this can apply to any disease state. But as, I'm a cardio as a cardiologist, I'll talk about heart disease and give you one disease state that we treat. Uh, we're going to talk about risk factors for heart failure, current therapies. And the question is, can heart failure be reversed? Many of you may have family members who have been told you have heart failure and may need to transplant, uh, et cetera. So we're going to talk about, can we uh, reverse that condition non-invasively? And so then, we're going to talk about this food prescription approach. Can you use food in a practical manner? We'll show you some data, and we'll talk about uh, age limitations. But first, I want to talk about a tale of two paradigms, a tale of two uh, paradigms in one city. And so here is a David, typical David versus Goliath uh, scenario. At the top here is a picture of the Texas Medical Center. The Texas Medical Center is the largest medical center in the world huge. It's in, in walking distance. And just four miles, four miles south of this huge area here, it has its own zip code. It's so large. Uh, four miles south of there is David. And this is where I work. And I work here also. Actually, this building right here is a professional. You know, these towers, every year, you know, this institution build a tower, they'll build a tower higher, and they'll build a tower higher. So the towers go up, <laughs> etc. You also have, uh, we'll go over some of the details later, but it's a lot of uh, fascinating things going there. But here's our little institution here, just four miles south, and it's Montgomery Heart and Wellness. And so we're in the shadows of the largest medical center. So let's, let's look at Goliath, first of all. So the largest medical center in the world has 54 medicine-related institutions, 21 hospitals, eight special institutions, eight academic research institutions, two pharmacy schools, a dental school. At one point, it was the eighth largest business district in the U.S. It uh, performs more heart surgery anywhere else in the world. Uh, it has three heart transplant centers. You know, it, it's unusual to have a heart transplant center in a, a state or a city. There are three heart transplant centers in walking distance in the Texas Medical Center. Uh, they do 180,000 surgeries annually, 3,300 patient visits a day, 8 million annually. Uh, the largest children's hospital in the world, largest cancer hospital in the world, and MD Anderson uh, at a $20 billion budget. So what about David? Well, smallest medical center in the world. We call ourselves a medical center. We like to do that. Uh, one medical building, but we have free parking, so that's, that beats <laughs> Goliath. Over two dozen smoothies and salads sold. Uh, treat 100 to 120 patients a week and far less than $20 billion budget. So how do I have the audacity to compare David to Goliath? Well, we're going to talk about this because we want to talk about the Goliath approach. So what is the Goliath approach to medicine and why does David think he can beat Goliath in this whole approach uh, to health care? Well, we're going to talk about Jim and his sore thumb. So Jim uh, gets a vice grip stuck on his thumb. He's working in his garage, he's dealing with a vice grip, gets it stuck on the thumb, stuck on the thumb. 
Happens about two weeks ago. This is a vice grip for those of you who are not mechanically inclined. And uh, so Jim goes to his doctor, and he says, Doctor, I have a sore thumb. It's tender and it's swollen. It's got this vice grip stuck on it. So his doctor takes a history, says, you have any history of thumb problems, any family members with thumb problems? He says, no. Uh, and uh, examines the thumb. The right thumb is tender. Left thumb is normal. So after a complete evaluation, an assessment, the doctor pulls out his prescription pad, writes for Motrin 200 milligrams every eight hours, Tylenol number three, and says follow up in two weeks. So Dr. Goliath sees him back in two weeks, still has pain, partial relief for a week and a half, but it, the swelling increases. But he has a new symptom now, constipation. So his doctor writes for increased dose of Motrin, continues to change to Tylenol number four, it's a bit stronger than Tylenol number three. Uh, and he gives them lactulose for the constipation. And that's, lactulose works pretty well for constipation. He gets a blood test for the kidney and liver because you're on medication, it could affect both. So he's going to evaluate that. It's an astute doctor. Uh, and then says follow up in two weeks. So that's all pretty good, right? So visit three. He comes back, sees Dr. Goliath. Partial pain relief, continued swelling. Persistent and slightly worse than constipation, despite the fact he's been on lactulose. But the blood test shows he has some abnormal kidney and liver function. So that doesn't look too good. So the doctor writes for endomethacin in place of Motrin, continues the Tylenol number four, and he sends him to a kidney and GI specialist because of the abnormal blood test. And so then he says follow up in six weeks. So Dr. Goliath is doing his job, but there's some problems here. Uh, one night, Jim gets a sudden onset of fever and chills, gets rushed to a local hospital, and an infected gangrenous thumb. Bad news for Jim. So they have to rush him, admit him to the hospital, rush him to the OR, and he has to get his thumb amputated. Kidney failure is due to the infection and all the NSAIDs he was taking. Uh, so he's put on dialysis, and his hospital stay is prolonged for about three months. Uh, he goes to one of these LTAC hospitals for recovery. But there's good news here. There's always a silver lining, right? The insurance covers everything. Okay? There's no application of pre existing condition. Jim leaves elated. He's got 25 new prescription medications, and Jim marvels over the wonders of modern medicine and Obamacare. So that's great, right? What do you mean? You guys, this is standard. Medical care. Y'all have any better ideas? What? Remove the vice grip. Okay. Smart at it. Now, this is kind of ridiculous, right? The scenario I gave you is quite ridiculous. It's ridiculous because it's pretty obvious. You know, the guy's got a vice grip, he's walking in, it's pain, it's obvious the vice grip is there, but all these other forms of therapy are prescribed, not treating what? The cause, but rather what? The symptoms. And the treatment of the symptoms only lead to what? More symptoms, more problems. The underlying disease is not being treated. It may be masked temporarily, but it's not treated. The problem with this scenario isn't that it's ridiculous in the sense of the way I presented it. The problem with this scenario is that it's true. Because every day, patients see their doctors with problem after problem after problem. And we ignore the vice grip. We're only treating, or I should say masking, the symptoms. And the underlying vice grip to probably 95% of our chronic illnesses is the bad food that we consume. And we ignore that. And so we want to talk about how David is going to have to overcome Goliath because if David doesn't overcome Goliath, Goliath is going to break us all. And so we need to make some changes. But before we do that, I'd like to talk about my favorite subject. Y'all recognize this? It's a red truck, right. It's my red truck. Uh, I bought this truck in 1996. And Dr. May said, hurry up, we don't have much time. Um, you see, this is an odometer. Y'all read that number? 299,999. Uh, oh, that's it. 
Yeah, the truck is uh, 20 years old. And this is 300,000. Now, this was taken three years ago. It actually has 319,000 miles now. Uh, the point is, I've taken good care of this truck. When I take this truck in, it gets the best oil, the best transmission fluid. I have them given the best gaskets and filters and all that stuff. This is a well-fed truck. Over 319,000 miles, size over 20 years old, rides as good as new. A well-fed engine, it's in great shape. What am I getting at here? The heart is an engine. Oops, excuse me. A well-fed heart will function normally. A poorly fed heart will go into failure. And we want to talk about the mechanism. It's as simple as that. But I'm going to go into some details just to break it down. So first and foremost, what is congestive heart failure? Some of you may have had family members diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Some of you may have been told. And that word you know, implies some pretty horrible things. It means your heart's about to give out. Uh, it doesn't always mean that. A chronic condition in which the heart doesn't pump as well as it should is essentially what congestive heart failure is, or heart failure in general. So in other words, if your heart's not circulating blood adequately for your needs, then you have some form of heart failure. Doesn't mean you're about to croak, it just means that your heart's not performing, it's failing to perform to suit your needs. So we need to get the heart strong. Now, we kind of divide heart failure into two parts. There's what's called diastolic and systolic heart failure. Excuse some of the medical terminology, but the heart does two things. It contracts and relaxes, contracts and relaxes, contracts and relaxes. Both of those phases are important. We can understand the contraction part because we can understand it's squeezing, it's ejecting blood out. We say, well, okay, we need to do that. But it also needs to allow blood in. So the heart has to relax effectively, and it also has to contract effects. So there are two phases, diastolic phase and the systolic phase. And the diastolic phase, if the heart's thickened and stiff, and it's not getting adequate blood flow, it doesn't relax enough. And so if you have a chamber that should be, say, I don't know, 1,000 mLs, but it only relaxes and allows in 250 mLs, then that's a small amount of volume. So like drinking a small glass of water, you're really thirsty, and you need a large glass of water. So diastolic dysfunction is like the heart doesn't relax enough to allow enough fluid in. And if it doesn't allow enough fluid in, it can't eject enough fluid out. Systolic dysfunction is when it doesn't squeeze adequately, so it doesn't eject enough blood out. And oftentimes, patients can have a combination. They can have both or they can have one or the other. And so when we do echocardiograms and other types of studies, we evaluate the heart for that condition. What are the symptoms of heart failure? There's a long list here. And many of these symptoms are symptoms that we sort of blow off. Shortness of breath, okay, we can probably, you know, identify with that. How about fatigue? You just don't have much get up and go. Fluid retention, loss of appetite. Anybody thought of the loss of appetite being heart failure? It could be. Chest discomfort, brain fog, forgetting where your keys are, frequent urination at night, memory loss, nausea, vomiting, stomach bloating, weakness, lung congestion, wheezing, coughing, palpitation, irri a whole list of things. In fact, heart failure can mimic just about any symptom. Why is that? Because every part of your body needs what? Blood and circulation. And so if the heart's not perfusing the brain, you lose memory. Okay? If it's not perfusing the legs adequately, I, had, uh, I saw a patient once, when he walked a certain amount, his legs would give out. He had to rest and walk until his legs get out. We did angiograms. There was no blockage in the arteries. But his heart function was impaired. And so we improved his cardiac function. The symptoms went away. So you can have a variety of symptoms that's mimicking heart failure because the heart circulates and provides oxygenated blood to every part of the body. So it's really important. It can be a masked symptom because these are symptoms that we get for other reasons, so we may not know we're in heart failure with these symptoms. But let's look at the epidemiology of heart failure. About 5.7 million adults in the U.S. have it. About uh, one in nine deaths in 2009, half the people with heart failure would die within five years. So you have congestive heart failure, and doctors give you five years oftentimes. But those are statistics. We'll talk about how you can avoid that. Heart failure costs in the nation over $30 billion. So it's very expensive, it's very lethal, and it's very problematic. So what are the drivers of heart failure? How do you get it? Well, heart disease, you can have coronary disease. Someone's had multiple heart attacks. Your heart's scarred, it can become weakened, okay? You can also have blocked arteries and you're not circulating blood to the heart muscle itself, so the heart won't pump effectively that way either. 
You can have valvular disease to where the heart is strained due to the valve that's too leaky or valve that's too tight. High blood pressure, very common cause of heart uh, failure. And diabetes, again, a common cause of heart failure because in part it contributes to coronary disease, but diabetes also can contribute to heart uh, dysfunction itself. If you look at the prevalence of heart disease in general, whether it's heart attacks, heart failure and the like, we notice by looking at this graph that as we get older, in the bar graphs, the blue is for men, red is for women. The younger ages are to the left, and as we go to the right, the ages get, uh, we get older. So from 20 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, and so on, the prevalence of heart disease gets up, increases. And so what that implies is that heart failure or heart disease is what? A natural part of aging. That's what people think. As you get older, you're supposed to have disease. But we really shouldn't accept that. Certainly not at 55 years old, you think half the people should have heart disease? That's kind of unusual. It shouldn't be. It's sort of like if your noses were falling off. You know, by the time you're 50 years old, half the people's noses will fall off. So, oh, that's just a part of aging, right? Should we accept those things? No. We say, there's a problem. Let's figure it out. I think there's a problem here. Let's figure it out. That's one point. The other point I want to make is that in the younger ages, more men have heart disease than women. By the time we get into our 40s and 50s, women catch up, and they pass us up in our 50s. So, Heart disease is a woman's disease. When I was in medical school, you know, it was typically a 55-year-old man coming in, smoker, et cetera, with chest pain. That was a classic heart disease. But the classic heart disease patient now is female, especially beyond the age 50. But the third thing I want to point out in this slide is what this slide does not show. If you look on this bar graph here, age 20 to 34, we see that there's an estimated prevalence of heart disease in men of about 11%. And many of you heard Dr. Esselstyn talk and other people, Dr. Campbell talk. Back in the 50s, they did autopsy studies on male soldiers who died from traumatic injury in the Korean War. And when they autopsy, they looked at about 300 hearts. And these were people killed from gunshot wounds, et cetera. They didn't have heart attacks. And when they autopsied their hearts, the prevalence wasn't 11%. Can you guess what the prevalence is? Who's heard those talks? It was about 77%. The average age of these men is 22. And they saw a prevalence of 77% of heart disease. In other words, they looked in the arteries, they opened up the arteries, and looked in and saw plaque. That's the most sensitive test you can get. 77%. So you got to take the tail of my arrow. Instead of starting here and going up, you take the tail and you go here and then go up. So if you go up from here, then what's the prevalence of heart disease at this age, this age, that age? 100%. If you on the standard American diet, you're virtually guaranteed to have heart disease beyond the age of 20, maybe even earlier than that. So we're not just talking about an isolated situation. That's why it's the number one killer. Virtually everybody has it. So if everybody has it, it's just a matter of who's going to croak. Okay? So we have to do something about it in a sense that we have to understand that this is a very prevalent disease and we have to address it in a very aggressive manner. Now, why is it that my graphs show 11% and the autopsy show a higher percent? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, the sensitivity, if I were to go and do an EKG in every one of you, the EKG will be specific and sensitive enough to pick up heart disease less than half the percent of time. In other words, I do an EKG, the sensitivity specificity of an EKG, this arresting screening EKG is less than 50% studies are shown. So it's less than a coin toss. I can do echocardiograms, I can do stress tests, I can do many different tests and still not pick up the coronary disease. I've done angiograms. I've done an angiogram of a patient in the middle of the night. I rush to the I get called in the middle of the night. It's a patient in the emergency room having a heart attack. Rush there, he's having chest pains, diaphoretic, EKG, classic heart attack. Rush him to the cath lab right then and there stick the artery, inject the coronaries, and see nothing. Why? Well, what happens is he has coronary disease, but by the, and he had a clot form. By the time I shot the, took a picture of the arteries, the clot dissolved, so I don't see the clot, and the residual disease is too small to be seen by angiogram. And we've seen many cases where you do a coronary angiogram. We've, we've always, when I was in medical school and cardiology training, we taught that was the gold standard. Coronary angiogram, the gold standard. The coronary angiogram looks good, you're clean. See you later. You don't have heart disease. That's wrong. 
that's wrong. And so we know that our tests are not specific and sensitive enough to pick up the disease. And, and although that slide, I don't have that slide in this talk, but in other talks, I give you the most sensitive and specific test, diagnostic and therapeutic test that you can use for any disease. You know what that diagnostic tool is? It's the meal plate. Your breakfast, the meal plate. Your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner meal plate. That's the only way to screen disease. If there's anything that's causing heart disease, diabetes, or cancer on that meal plate, then you're at risk for that disease. No other test is that sensitive. That's where you start for any diagnostic and therapeutic intervention. We're going to talk about precisely how we do that. So anyway, if you look at prevalence of hypertension, same thing. As we get older, it becomes more prevalent. Let's look at diabetes. Now, this is a population study since from 1980 to 2010. The prevalence of diabetes has increased exponentially. Okay? So then the question is, what's going on? We all know the answer. You've heard it this weekend. It's the food. And let's analyze that. We've increased our meat consumption from uh, 1900 to 2000. It's gone up significantly. If we look at, uh, there's the beef. <clears throat> Cheese has gone up exponentially. Our consumption as a population. Look at the sugar. Now this top graph here, bar here is red. It's the total sugar consumption. And it has gone up from the 60s to the 2000, early 2000s. But the, if you look at the contributing factor, it's not the natural sugars. This, is, this bar graph here shows cane and beet sugar. This is the whole food sugar. But the high fructose corn sugar is what's contributed to that increase. So we eat a lot of processed sugars. But just notice the shape of this graph. Notice the shape of this graph. OK? I'm missing my chicken graph. OK? If we look at the sugar graph and compare that to diabetes, here's diabetes. See the shape of that? And see the shape of this. And look at the shape of this graph. Look at the shape of this graph. Now, this is not very good science I'm doing here. But does this shape look like that shape? Does that shape look like that shape? So the prevalence, increased prevalence of, of diabetes masks the increased prevalence of the consumption of dairy and consumption of chicken. It really doesn't mask the consumption. This is not really exponential. It's kind of plateaued, actually. Now, again, this is not scientific stuff. I'm just sort of throwing some evidence up here. If we were in a court, we'd say, well, this is some evidence here that this doesn't quite match that. The, the, prob, the, the issue is we've shown scientifically is the animal protein consumption that's driving up diabetes, and which, of course, drives up heart disease. So the issue is, can food be used to reverse heart failure? As I posed the question earlier, if you're a patient, you have, you know, you've had four heart attacks, you've been told you only have a few months to live, uh, what can we do? Well, first of all, what we do in our approach is that we evaluate your heart condition. And here I outline is multiple ways we can evaluate cardiac function. The ejection fraction, that's percent of blood that's squeezed out with each contraction. We do that with an echocardiogram. We can do that with other tests. And we evaluate the systolic function of the heart. We can have a non-invasive way of measuring what's called stroke volume. That's the amount of blood that's ejected uh, with each contraction. And the more the stroke volume, the better the circulation. We can measure the amount of resistance that the heart is pumping against. Blood pressure is an indirect way of doing it, is one way of doing it, but we can directly measure vascular resistance. Uh, with certain uh, tools in the office. We can measure your cardiac output. That's the measure of circulation. Okay, and we can also measure the heart size. Now, bigger is not better when it comes to heart size. If your heart's enlarged, it's enlarged for some adverse reason, and it's not functioning in its optimal effect. So with these hemodynamic monitoring uh, techniques, what we did is we took a group of patients and we said, well, can we use a plant-based diet to effectively improve these monitors? Can we improve cardiac output? Can we improve stroke volume? Okay, can we decrease vascular resistance? So 15 individuals, we put them on a nutritional program. Uh, we detox them for about four weeks. Uh, they weren't instructed not to change their exercise. So if they're exercising, they can continue. If they weren't, they didn't have to start. Uh, and then we assessed their hemodynamics. We did, of course, the usual anthropomorphic measurements. But we also measure cardiac output, stroke volume, 
systemic vascular resistance, thoracic fluid content, heart rate. There's a special device called a BIO-Z device that measures uh, cardiac impedance. It's not important, but there's a way that we can do this without me having to take you to the hospital and stick a needle in your neck and measure these things directly. So uh, they had group lectures and support groups, shopping rounds. So we gave them a lot of support over this four-week period of time. So what did we see? Well, there was a trend toward increased cardiac output. It didn't read statistical significance, but we saw that cardiac output improved. The stroke volume significantly improved. The vascular resistance significantly reduced. The thoracic fluid content, that means the amount of volume inside the blood vessels improved. Uh, the heart rate went down. So when the heart is beating slower, it's beating more effectively. If you notice athletes who are highly trained, their heart rates go down because the heart's beating more effectively. Uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressures improved. Their weight and weight circumference and BMI uh, improved, et cetera. Here's some graphical uh, display of that. Stroke volume went up by 16.4%. Uh, cardiac output went up by 9.5%. Thoracic fluid content went up by 8.3%. And the heart got smaller. These things, all parameters all went down as well. as Notice that the BMI weight reduction around 3%. And notice the vascular resistance reduction and systolic and diastolic blood pressure decreased by more. I'll have more to say on that in a few minutes. There's a difference. Now, if you look at anthropomorphic measures and also blood pressure trends, we wanted to compare the reduction in weight with the reduction in blood pressure. Oftentimes, your doctor will say, well, if you just simply lose weight, your blood pressure will get better or your cholesterol will come down. And the question on that is, well, is that true? Is blood pressure reduction directly secondary to weight reduction or are they independent processes? Well, we had a biostatistician analyze our trends, and they used a mixed model measurement design, and they looked at trends over time. They defined what was a linear trend, which is a straight decrease or increase, a quadratic trend, which has one bend in the line, and a cubic trend, which has two bends. So when we looked at systolic and diastolic blood pressure, it had both a linear trend and also a cubic trend, which meant it had two bends in the line, in the curve. If you look at weight and BMI trends, they had a linear trend, but they also had a quadratic trend. So that meant over time, it had just one bend. I'm going to show you some uh, graphical displays of this. Waist circumference had a linear trend, and it trended toward quadratic. So it followed more of that of weight and BMI. So what does all this mean? Well, what it means is that blood pressure weight changes are independent. Because if, if, if the blood pressure reduction was secondary to weight reduction, then you would see the same type of trend reduction in blood pressure and weight. It suggests independent mechanism, suggests blood pressure reduction that's not secondary to weight. Why am I making such a big deal of this? I'm making a big deal of this because of the following. And I'll give an example of a patient later. But lots of patients go through all sorts of treatments, gastric bypass surgery, weight reduction pills, all sorts of gimmicks and gadgets just to lose weight in the pretense of improving the health. But the mechanism of weight loss is independent of these health parameters. If we look at the blood pressure change, this is baseline week one, two, and three. It drops and it kind of bumps up and comes down again. Diastolic blood pressure drops, we get a bump and it drops. Now, you may ask, why does this increase? I don't have a direct answer. My suspicion is that there's a detox reaction. The body's probably releasing catecholamines at this point, and so there's an increased release of epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, those of you who are health care and plan people, that, that may be causing this bump in blood pressure. Some people say there could be compliance, but I don't think that everyone's calling each other and saying we're going to become non-compliant on week three. So I think there's a physiological process here. Uh, and, and we've got future studies that's going to look at the catecholamine changes over this period of time. And if you look at weight changes, it drops and then plateaus down. BMI drops, plateaus down. Weight circumference drops, plateaus down. If I compare all of these, this red bar is diastolic blood pressure. See how that comes up? Systolic comes up. But weight is going down. So these are, are different. So this, this change overall cannot be secondary to that. They would change over time. So I want to make a big point of that because it's all about nourishing the body properly and the mechanism of weight, of blood pressure control is a physiological mechanism independent of weight loss. You know, you could get cancer and lose weight. There are many unhealthy ways of losing weight. So weight loss is a, is a process that could be both healthy and unhealthy. So is blood pressure dropping. So 
But the point is that these are independent mechanisms in the setting of getting better. So what if we were to take patients and do a cardiac MRI? Now, this is a non-invasive test, so I took another non-invasive test. And a cardiac MRI gives me a lot of detailed information of the heart. It actually shows a picture of the heart. I can see how thick the heart muscle is. I can see how well it contracts. I can see how strong it is. So can we show an improvement of cardiac parameters by cardiac MRI using a plant-based diet? So what we did, uh, we had a series of three patients. Now, I have many other patients where I had different modalities, MRI plus nuclear or cath. But I only want to use one modality. So we were able to get three patients where we were able to follow them on a plant-based diet. They had an ejection fraction of 22% for more than a year. A 22% ejection fraction, they're putting you on the transplant list. You have to get a defibrillator, uh, et cetera. If your ejection fraction is this low, you're in bad shape. Ischemic heart failure, et cetera. Uh, they were treated with a standard heart failure management, as, as they should be. But we also gave a food prescription plan, put them on food level 0 to 4A. I'll explain that later. For six weeks, they were monitored clinically. Medication were adjusted as needed. MRI was done at baseline. And on follow-up, the three patients had an average of 78 days follow-up. So what did we find? Increase in ejection fraction, increase in cardiac output, increase in stroke volume. There was a decrease in LV mass. What happens is the heart gets thickened. And, and sometimes people say your heart's enlarged. It can be enlarged because it's dilated. It can also be enlarged because it's thickened. So the heart was swollen, and we saw the swelling of the heart muscle go down. End diastolic volume went down, end systolic volume. The bottom line, of the heart got stronger. These are these upper three parameters, and it got smaller. Okay? The promising results, we need to do more work. Ejection, baseline EF was 22% on average after uh, for 79 days, 78 days, rather, 42%. They went from... Transplant list, needing a defibrillator, to off the transplant list, not needing a defibrillator. Um, again, these parameters showing the heart getting stronger, these parameters showing the heart getting smaller. So again, you take the most lethal killer, heart disease number one, heart failure being number one component within heart disease, the most lethal killer in the United States, and you can reverse it in many cases, quite simply. And it's, it's not like 12 months, three years, four years. I'm talking about one month in one case, 78 days in the other case. And these people are feeling much better within a matter of the first week or two. So let's look at a case report. One of these patients in the, the last group I mentioned, the 46-year-old lady, and she came to see us because um, she wanted to lose weight. She went to see a gastric bypass surgeon. And uh, because she was at a, a uh, company uh, health fair, and she was obese and had blood pressure issues, was told she was a pre-diabetic, and she felt that she only lost weight. She didn't see my slide earlier, but she only lost weight. Her blood pressure and all these things would get better. She saw the gastric bypass surgeon. They did an EKG. It was abnormal. She came to see us as a result of that. She had complained of chest discomfort that woke her from sleep. That bothered me. Shortness of breath with exertion. She had fatigue, and so we did an EKG in our office. It was abnormal. We did an echocardiogram, and this bothered me. Her ejection fraction was 20 to 25 percent. So with these symptoms, this ejection fraction, I said, let's go to the hospital. We need to do a coronary angiogram. We did, and we saw this. This is about a 90 percent lesion in what's called the LAD, or left anterior descending coronary artery. It's the main uh, artery for the feeding blood down the left ventricle. Uh, this is a time bomb. We used to call this the widow maker in medical school. In this case, it's a potential widower maker. Uh, and this is my catheter, and you can see this vessel, the left main, which is also small compared to the catheter size. This is not an easy vessel to put a stent in. You try to put a stent here, you push plaque back to the left main, you kill her on the table. So we didn't try to bother with putting a stent in. Uh, the best standard medical surgical option would be a single vessel bypass. Open the chest up and maybe, maybe do a limited procedure uh, thoroscopically, but a single vessel bypass was probably her best option. In that regard, we uh, came off and talked to her about that. So, well, look, you know, here are the options, medications, nutrition, you know, single vessel bypass, et cetera. She actually chose the lifestyle approach. Now, we had talked to her about this before I did the angiogram. We had already gone through that whole scenario, and she wanted to continue down that path. So in essence, what we did, we assessed the baseline condition, and she had significant coronary disease. We optimized her medically. Uh, we discussed 
you know, interventional surgical options. Say, look, you can have surgery, et cetera. We didn't recommend angioplasty, it wouldn't be safe. Uh, and we also recommended some non-pharmacological treatment, and she wanted to go the non-pharmacological way. Now, what we did is we introduced her to a food classification system, and I, I'm showing you this. It's a busy slide. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. What I want you to get from this slide is this. There are certain levels. There's different circles, levels 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. When you're treating patients with specific diseases, it's not enough to say, okay, just eat healthier or just eat plant-based or just eat vegan because you don't know what they're going to do. They may go out and fry everything or whatever the case is, get things with chemical con So if you're going to give them a prescription for food, it has to be a prescription. If your doctor gives you a medication prescription, they give you a prescription say, okay, take this pill this many times a day. They don't go and say, just go get some medication, go take some antibiotics. They say, no, take this. So we have to do that to a certain extent with food in the setting of trying to help someone reverse a specific illness. So we make sure that we may put them on a nutritional detox, and as the level goes from 0 to 10, it becomes, quote, unquote, less healthy. From 0 to 6, we consider all of that to be healthy, but from 6 down to 0, it's a more aggressive nutritional detox. And as juice feasting, water fasting, which is in the zero level, one to three is raw solids, four A is, uh, and B are raw, four C is lightly steamed, and then five and six is different levels of steaming and boiling and heating to a certain degree. So depending on how sick the person is, we'll put them at one level or the other, but there's a certain precision in terms of what we're recommending. That's what I want you to take from that slide. So she was on levels zero to three. We started on a beta block and different medication for heart disease. There's external counterpulsation therapy, which is good to treat symptoms of heart disease. Um, we use that for her. And we just monitor her. We offered bypass, which she refused. And we monitor her clinically. So on the food side, the thing we focus on up front is the foods to avoid. It's very important. All forms of dead animal flesh, dairy products, egg, egg products, processed cereals, cooked grains, soft drinks, et cetera. And they say, well, some of these things are, are not bad foods, and I agree. On the detox phase, we remove everything. Why? Because when patients are new to this arena, they may go and eat rice or something that may have butter on it, it may have cooked oils, et cetera. So we have to remove all forms of cooked foods to eliminate that potential error, especially if somebody's life is depending on it. And so we do it for a limited period of time, but we really emphasize this food to avoid setting. After about five and a half months, her coronary arteries uh, improved. This left main, see it's bigger than my catheter, that improved. Her EF went from about 24% to 50%. Now, this has been done before. It's not like this is the first one, a uh, you know, patient. But I show you this as an example of someone who can come in, and this is therapy that can be applied in a clinical setting. And, and, and it's effective therapy, probably the most effective therapy. Now, if she regressed or failed on the diet, then we were ready to go and do something else. But the point is that this is, should be the first line. So baseline, and then afterwards, the body heals itself in the setting of optimal nutrition. So, but what's the explanation? Is it hocus pocus? No, not really. Your body is designed to maintain itself on a regular basis. Has anyone ever cut themselves before? and not gone and gotten st st stitches, what happens to the cut? It heals. It might be a scar, but your body's designed to heal up. And any form of injury, the body's designed to heal itself. What we have to do is stop healing, stop injuring it. So what happens if you cut yourself by accident and you do nothing else, it'll heal. But what if you just kept gouging it? Every morning, kept whack it away. Lunchtime, whack it away. Dinner time, whack it away. Next breakfast, whack it away. Every time you whack into that cut, will it heal? No. The problem with our heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, all these chronic illnesses, these are just like that cut. The problem is we keep gashing. The same chicken and fish and biscuits and gravy that cause the injury, we keep applying it. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. And don't let Thanksgiving come, my goodness. <laughs> Do you know the number one day for dying from heart disease? Christmas. It's Christmas, right around Christmas Day. You know, you warm it up in Thanksgiving, building up the plaque and all the inflammation and all the parties and things you go to. And, and you know, everybody's got coronary disease, just a matter of who's going to knock off a critical plaque, have a heart attack. 
and that's the problem. So the explanation is simply, and we looked at these biomarkers, and we took 200 subjects, applied the same approach, said so let's measure their biomarkers, and biomarkers are just inflammatory markers. These are things we can measure in the blood. And what I want to show you here, these are the changes. So over four weeks, 200 subjects, the average reduction in weight, blood pressure, et cetera, was somewhere around 5%. Average reduction in cholesterol, somewhere around 10%. But look at the reduction in inflammation, about 35%. The reason I show percent reduction, I want to show a comparison. Everybody's enamored about weight loss, but what's happening at the magic is happening at the cellular level. Inflammation is being reduced by a greater amount, far greater than we see on the surface. So, but you have to apply this in a very aggressive manner. But this inflammation reduction, and that's what we saw in this lady when that coronary plaque went from 90% to nothing, basically all we saw was inflammation. And basically sort of been described as like a zit inside the coronary arteries that just goes away. And so that can happen when you just simply put out the fire. The last point I want to make is what's the true disease? You know, we talk about heart disease and arthritis and lupus, and, and we have many different names for the different conditions that people will present with. But there's really, in most cases, probably 95%, really one disease, and it's bad food. It's bad fooditis. And this is where, and so it doesn't matter whether you have a 90% coronary plaque or not. It doesn't matter whether you have arthritis or not. It doesn't matter whether you have a diagnosis of cancer or not. It doesn't matter whether you have a diagnosis of anything. You could be physically fit, running, et cetera. If you're putting this junk in your system, you have a disease. You're only waiting. It's only a matter of time before it manifests. Like Russian roulette, right? Click. Hey, I'm fine. Pass the gun around. Click. It's only a matter of time. OK? And you're playing Russian roulette. And there are people like me, just when a lot, what long white coats, just waiting for you to come and have your first heart attack, or first stroke, first occurrence of diabetes, because you have bad fooditis. And the manifestation occurs later, and that's when we make the diagnosis. So we're here about talking about getting rid of the underlying disease and not waiting for the manifestation to occur. And I think you're empowered to do that. So how old is too old? Okay. Never. Okay, great. I like that answer. Uh, this past February, February 21st, I turned 52. And this patient, this lady sitting right next to me, she turned 102. Wow. Actually, she turned 102 on February 22nd, one day after my birthday. She came to us at the tender age of 101. And uh, she was on about seven medications and heart failure. And she says, you know, I want to reduce these medications, et cetera. So what did I say? Oh, you're too old. Eat what you want. No? No. I said, you know, get on a plant-based diet. So she did. And we got her down to, I think in this picture, she was down to one medication, feeling better, and uh, doing great. So it's not too late. One exception, we have gone out to the graveyard a few times, sprinkle some smoothies and green juices. We hadn't had anybody get up yet, um, but I'll keep you posted on that one. Anyway, but here's a short history lesson. Here's Dr. Simmelweis. He practiced as a Hungarian physician. He practiced back in the 19th century, and uh, Dr. Simmelweis uh, ran two birthing centers, and that back then, puerperal uh, fever, uh, childbirth fever, was a common cause of death in women. About 10 to 35 percent of women died. Uh, from childbirth fever back then. But he ran two different birthing centers, and you notice something peculiar. One of the birthing centers, he only had a death rate of 1%. The other had the usual death rate of 10 to 35%. And so he couldn't quite figure out why. One birthing center, he had uh, midwives delivering babies, death rate of 1%. Medical students and doctors delivering babies, death rate of 10 to 35%. So he did all sorts of tests, but he found out there was something in the fluid because the medical students were dissecting cadavers in the morning and delivering babies at night. So there must be something in the cadaver fluid. So he said, okay, wash your hands, okay? When he did that, death rate went down to 1%. So he went to the medical community. He said, hey, guys, I figured something out. He says, you know, if we wash our hands, we get rid of these guys. You know, you're crazy. 
you know, these death rates are due to a, a variety of different causes, a variety of different ailments. You know, it can't be something as simple as washing your hands. And he was persistent to the point that he kicked him out of the medical society. And he was kicked out of the medical society. He was uh, then committed to an insane asylum. And he was beaten to death within two weeks. So you better be careful, Dr. Mason. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the bottom line is that uh, it wasn't until years after his death they discovered the germ theory by Louis Pasteur. Uh, Dr. Lister started applying um, uh, antiseptic techniques and found that these methods uh, were very beneficial in surgical techniques. So the, the simple story is this. Uh, we often talk about people who eat bad food and survive. Well, just think about this story. The, this, the, the death rate was, what, 10 to 35 percent. So that means about 65 to 90 percent of people survive, right? So then if you were getting ready to have a baby, I said, well, I just, you know, Diastatic cadavers, do I need to wash my hands? 65 to 90 percent of the time, people survive. Would that be acceptable to you? No. But why do people like to talk about Uncle Joe, who ate fried chicken and smoked and drank and chased women, who lived to 94 years old? You know, you don't base things on the exception, even though that's a relatively large exception. That's one thing. And they thought there were many different unrelated causes of disease. Doesn't that sound familiar to you also? Diabetes here, arthritis, you give different, you see different specialties, medical specialty that are training. It's sub, sub special. I went to training, I went to medical school, then I went to, I did internal medicine training, then after that I went to cardiology, and after that I went to cardiac electrophysiology. That deals with the heart rhythm, electrical circuit of the heart. So we get specialty trainings and just little nuances. Okay, so we deal with these diseases in a very minute uh, reductionist approach. But notice the simplicity of the solution. Wash your hands. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Plant-based foods. So the point, if we can make these results with washing our hands, what do you think we can do by just simply washing our food and washing the way we eat? Thank you very much. I'll open the floor for questions, <laughs> comments, smart remarks, if we have time. And. Uh, that's the book. If you, it's available outside, I think. And if you have, need any more information for the slides, you can uh, text that number. Yes. I'd like to know how beneficial is taking a low dose aspirin for um, heart disease because at a certain age, doctors recommend that. Yeah. I, so the question about a low dose aspirin for heart disease, I still recommend that, especially patients with risk factors for heart disease, but. It depends on how well they do with their lifestyle. So if I get someone who's doing the optimal things from a lifestyle standpoint, then I'll then remove the aspirin. But, but it's a standard treatment. It's been shown to have some benefit in men preventing, reducing uh, heart attack risk. Women, some more, more stroke than heart attack. Uh, but there's still some benefit if you're going to do the standard American diet approach. But if you're doing the optimal things nutritionally or lifestyle, then Personally, what I do is I, I will reduce that, right. remove that. Are you going to moderate the questions or Sarah, Dr. Mason? Or, okay, it's your hand and then you after her. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm doing something here. Okay, time. that's fine. <laughs> 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 Did you get much resistance from Texas Medical Center to set up your little shop? <clears throat> and if you did, what did you do to entice that? So, did I get resistance from Texas Medical Center? The answer is no, because that's our building. We own that building, and we have a separate company that's four miles south of the medical center. So we're very close, so we're kind of independent. We're, we are independent of the medical center. So that's one. In terms of how my colleagues uh, respond, it's, it's, I would say it's been mixed, but more on the positive side. And, and the part of the reason, because I came into this from the inside. So when I started my practice, I wasn't doing plant-based medicine. I was you know, treating patients around the clock and planning defibrillators, doing heart casts, referring to, and it was later on in my career that I started doing this. So I was seen as one of them and still is seen as one of them, but who's converted. So it's, it's easier than had I come in from the other way and not been one of them. So now it's like, okay, we see your results. A colleague of mine who's a vascular surgeon is also vegan, and we're talking about collaborating and doing some studies using nutritional intervention in a perioperative setting. 
So there is some reception to this, and we're working on getting the food in the hospital, getting the doctors to adopt and that type of thing. So it, I mean, and as an individual cardiologist who refer patients to me, patients who, you know, he can't, you know, fix with their stents, and he's actually started the program himself and so on. So there's been some reception to a certain degree. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was kind of right along with the lady telling me her, which is like, uh, you know, the I can't speak to Chicago. There, there are cardiologists around the country who are doing this, and more and more docs than fine. If you go on the website for Plantrition, uh, they have a group of plant-based doctors who are nationwide, uh, plantrition.org or .com. Uh, and then, um, Cure for Nature, I think you got a number of doctors in your group too, Nelson. So, yeah. So, Plantrician, I know, has a website, and, and, and Plant Pure Nation has connections with lots of physicians who are around the country who are doing this. What we're doing in our operation, we, we actually receive patients from around the country to come for our specific treatment, and, um, and stay tuned. We're doing things that's going to spread you know, the, the approach that we're taking around. I think it had. Here and then you. Yes, ma'am. Are you noticing um, lower age patients, um, patients being diagnosed with heart disease at a lower age, mm -hmm. younger age children? <coughs> yeah, so the question is, am I noticing patients, younger patients with heart disease? And the answer is emphatically yes. Uh, in fact, the interesting point, uh, a side additional point to that is that I um, was talking to a young lady who uh, owns a nursing home, and it's like a, I don't know, fifth generation family owned nursing home. And what she said to me emphatically is that the patients at the nursing home were much, much younger. We're talking about in the 30s and 40s uh, who suffered stroke and heart failure and the like. So the nursing home patients are getting younger. And that was actually an, an eye opener to me. So, yes, the, the disease is uh, because our food is getting worse than what it was, it's been bad for a long time. It's only getting worse. Yes, sir. Yes. Is any of this, is it paid out of pocket for the insurance? Is there a way that insurance can cover if they would come to you? Yeah, so the question is, is this paid out of pocket? The way this program works, and I didn't go into details, is that we've designed it to where it's connected through the insurance. And so when they come in with the health problems, in fact, and because we're treating people with a medical diagnosis, and maybe someone with no medical diagnosis, who said, I want to get better, we have programs that are not insured for those patients as well, and they're cash-based or subscri subscription programs. But for someone who has a health problem, <coughs> then we use that medical diagnosis to build insurance for treating that health problem. And so when I bring them in, I'm doing ancillary studies and doing evaluations. I have my nutritionists who are there on staff, and we're applying all of these things in the context of a medical visit. So it's really integrated in, we have a, as Dr. Mason mentioned, we have a restaurant on site. It's a plant-based restaurant. It's open to the general public. But the benefit there is that we have meal plans, and we have a nutrition. We design foods according to the food classification system. So they start one of our programs. They get on a specific meal plan, and, and they follow through. So many of our patients we see, I have a patient in the 90s, patient in the 80s, and we've reduced their medication. I hardly see them in the office. I just run in, I see them in the restaurant. And one of my patients, she's like 92. We have yoga classes, so she's taking yoga. And she's in a restaurant. She negotiated 50% reduction on the price because she said, well, your, your price is too expensive and I'm too old. So, I mean, to, they get savvy. And so that, <laughs> but, but the point is that we reduce the medicine, reduce the, the health care visits, and we put them on the wellness side. And so even though that's out of pocket, it's still reducing the out of pocket for medications. Yes, sir, at the top. And then, yes. Uh, yes. Is it too late to help someone who has a, already has a pacemaker or a defibrillator? Great question. So is it too late for someone with a pacemaker defibrillator? As an electrophysiologist, I implant these pacemakers and defibrillators regularly. We have a lot of patients with pacemakers and defibrillators, and it's not too late. You know, the defibrillator pacemaker being in your system is not an impedance of a normal lifestyle. And it's not a problem if you have the defibrillator. The problem is you continue to eat the bad food that got you to the defibrillator to start with. And so, in fact, I have an opinion that if anybody has a stent or bypass or defibrillator or anything, it should be a mandate. Once you've gotten to that level of the healthcare system, then it should be mandated that you be put on a plant-based diet. And when you're spending that much money in the sick care system, 
then we need to, I mean, it's one thing to not have these conditions, but I think we should be that aggressive. But it's not too late. In fact, those people do quite well. Yes, sir. Yes. If, if a person was maybe 50 percent occluded uh, before they started plant-based nutrition, how low can the person get it down? Great question. So some have a 50 percent narrowing before they go plant-based. How low can they go? Well, we saw 90 percent go to nothing. But here's the thing. It depends on the nature of that plaque. If there's a lot of scar buildup, et cetera, some of that will remain indefinitely. So it's not so much the amount of narrowing that you see angiographically, but it's also the physiology and biochemistry of the vasculature. So the endothelial cells need to be healed. The smooth muscle cells need to be healed. So it's vascular endothelial function that you want to improve and therefore vascular function. So, so once you remove the toxic substances, inflammation goes down, vascular healing begins, the narrowing becomes less important. There was a lady over there been waiting for a long time. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm bad at just moderating. That's why I need to say. Okay. <laughs> um, can you speak to the importance of fasting, if you believe in that, and how, you know, does that make a difference? Because I know people are saying that it's really not good to do it. Yeah. So the question about fasting, is it good to do or not? You know, uh, it's a great question. And um, I was having a conversation with someone outside the door. The body is designed to fast. If you, if you think about it, almost any illness you get, one of the common denominators is anorexia, loss of appetite. So the body's design, it's almost like you're programmed. If you get sick, the body says fast. And so in essence, yes, fasting is very effective. In fact, at True North in California, there was a clinic where they do fasting. They fast people up to 40 days, 40 days and 40 nights. You heard of that before, right? Um, the point is, uh, it's probably the most effective way of healing. Now, fasting, in, to that extent, needs to be under direct medical supervision. Next to fasting, water fasting, is juice feasting. And we do juice feasting, and we've had lots of success with, success with juice feasting. And so, as close as you can get to a fasting state, it allows the body to heal, heal and rest. So, I do believe that fasting has a role, and we actually do intermittent fasting with our patients from time to time as part of the healing process. Great question. Uh, Let's go over here. Yes, with a hat on. That's you. <laughs> yeah, so not eating after 8 o'clock. It's ideal to eat during daylight. And so whether that's 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock, it's probably ideal to eat during daylight and let your body rest at night. Uh, however, uh, as a consolation of my patients, when we put these restrictions, all those do nots, uh, patients come and say, well, I'm hungry at midnight. I say, well, eat an apple. I'm okay with that. So I'll give in to the late night eating from time to time, even though I know it's not ideal because we're removing certain other things and the psychology of it. People get a sense of being hungry and so on and so forth. So I don't want them to go and grab a, a chicken wing or anything. So I'll give in to the late night eating uh, temporarily. But what we find out is that people, after they've been on a plant-based diet, the sense of hunger, and the hunger sensation a lot of people get isn't because they're not getting enough to eat. Oftentimes, it's the withdrawal sensation. You may have heard of the munchies. If somebody's on marijuana, and you stop smoking marijuana, you get the munchies. Some people laugh, and they've done marijuana before. This is not a legal state, so you all be careful. But anyway, um, so the point is that, uh, y yes, I, I agree that certain late night eating is not ideal, but, but we give in to that sometimes. Can you comment a bit more about the why you want people not to eat naturally? You know, we work on a, a diurnal pathway, a circadian rhythm, and a, the liver metabolism changes. There are a lot of things that are much more complex than what we have truly understand in terms of how the body works at night. But one, fasting is important. So you asked a question about fasting. The body's designed to fast to a certain extent. So overnight fasting is probably a regular form of fasting. So that process, that biochemical, physiological process needs to take place. So we're not really designed to be eating continuously. That's why in the hospital I don't like when they give the continual parental feeds and all of that stuff. So we should fast. And there are certain things, the liver metabolism, metabolism uh, certain things occur, that occurs with the liver metabolism at night that has to occur for a lot of healthy uh, uh, living. The body's blood gets dialyzed at night. If you eat certain horrible foods, you need to sleep longer 
than you do if you eat raw juice or natural clean food. So the cleaner your diet it gets, the less you have to sleep because the blood dialysis, that process of cleaning things from your blood is less. So that's a process that has to happen for a certain period of time. So fasting uh, is important and I think creating a period of time where you don't eat uh, is important. So not eating at night is also ideal for that reason. So this dialysis you're talking about, you're not talking about going to a machine. You're talking That's about a machine, yeah. The body cleaning the blood. That, I mean, I'm using that term loosely. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, when you mentioned you want to fasting, um, how, how does a diabetic Yeah, so the question of fasting as it relates to diabetics, um, we have diabetics that fast all the time. We treat, the data I showed you, probably two-thirds of them are diabetic. And the concern with diabetics, people often say, well, you know, you're diabetic and maybe you're on insulin or some other hypoglycemic agent, you have to eat. Well, one thing we do is that when we see our diabetics, depending on what their blood sugars are, and one thing we do in our clinic, I'm going to digress for a second, is that we take control of the whole patient. So if you come to my clinic and you're on 21 medications, it's nothing for us to see someone on 21 medic, 25 medications. One thing I tell them is so that we're going to take control of everything, okay? We are the boss. I'm the boss. Cardiologists are kind of arrogant like that. But the point is we have to do that because we're seeing them every week and their diet is changing. So a diabetic who may be taking 40 units of insulin a day and their blood sugars are running 130, I'm going to say stop the insulin. I'm going to say, stop the globuride, stop the, you know, whatever. And if your blood sugar goes above 200 or 250, give yourself five units of this and call us. So we'll put them on a regimen and give them that. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, they rarely have to give themselves any insulin. And so we feel comfortable juice feasting them or detoxing them in the setting of diabetes because the, the, the big trouble that diabetics have if you go into a diabetic coma, there are two mechanisms, too low and too high. So too low is what, about 40, 25, 15, 10, okay? You get that low, you're probably in a diabetic coma. Too high is somewhere close to 1,000. So let's say you're diabetic, you're not controlled, your blood sugar's running what? 250, 350, 400, right? Even the blood sugar of 350 is closer to 40 than it is to 1,000. So I'd rather err on the side of being too high than too low. You can always give yourself insulin. If you give yourself insulin, you can't take it back. So if somebody calls me in the middle of the night, my blood sugar is 500. You can give yourself 10 units of Lancers or whatever. Recheck it. If it's still high, give more. Drink water, et cetera. So the diabetics actually do very well on raw detox as well as raw juicing. In fact, a common thing, we've been doing this for almost a decade. Actually, we've been doing it for more than a decade. The boot camp's been almost a decade. But we have thousands of patients that we've seen. And the diabetics come back and says, I don't understand. They told me I can't eat fruit. I'm eating all this fruit. My blood sugar is controlled. That's the majority of the patients. We do have some who are brittle, and the insulin resistance don't correct right away, and we have to make adjustments. But we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. So when you say juicing, are they actually juicing the fruit or vegetable, or are they pulverizing it? Because some physicians, because I've heard this with some diabetics, will tell their diabetic patients, no, you either want to eat the actual fruit, um, but you don't want to just juice because that will run your glucose straight up. Yeah, and that's a great point. Let me make sure I'm, everybody hears that point. So the question is, are you telling your diabetic to pulverize it, smooth it, so you're getting the fiber or juice extracted, which is supposed to be more prob problematic and without the fiber? In our experience, thousands of patients, many of whom are doing juice feasting, not pulverizing, like a Jack LaLanne juice extract, fiber over here, juice over there, drinking it, they do well. Why is that? The raw juice is different than juice off the counter. It's different than the pasteurized, water, chemicalized stuff you get off the counter. And most of our evidence is on the juice. Uh, Dr. Michael Greger looked at a study where they looked at diabetics and juice and other things, and they saw that diabetics did better, worse with juice than whole foods. But that juice is something, it's, it's like Kool-Aid. Uh, and so you can't compare Kool-Aid to a, a raw natural food. Why do I think juice extracting is a little bit better than the smoothies? 
Theoretically, you should say, yeah, you should run your sugars up because you just got all that sugar, no fiber. But it's not just sugar without fiber. I actually have you know, other molecules in the food. The benefit of not having the fiber is that your body, your GI system is allowed to rest. Remember I said there's a benefit to fasting. So juice feasting is kind of between fasting and eating. Your body's getting nourishment. It's getting the proteins, vitamins, and minerals, and phytonutrients so that you can go to work every day. As opposed to true fasting with water, you have to be at bed rest. So it gives that intermediate process where your GI system is resting, your metabolic machinery is at rest, and so you're able to rest your metabolic machinery but nourish the body at the same time. It's almost like giving an intravenous nourishment enterally. And that's precisely what it is. And, and patients have done quite well. Last part. I'm okay with the Nutribullet. <laughs> there was a question over here that, yes. Um, what if someone's on prescription painkillers and they take it at night? So they're not eating after a certain time frame. They're only drinking water. But when you talk about how the body detoxes at night, you're putting codeine or whatever into your system. How, what, what would your recommendation be to make it less um, unhealthy or besides get off the painkillers? Yeah. So painkillers can be a particular problem. And we do wean painkillers as well. Someone like that, we may do some special things. We, we may put them on, uh, we have like a little mixture of uh, turmeric and ginger. We may put them on turmeric extracts. Uh, we have a special uh, uh, turmeric ginger paste, an herbalist put together for us. We try that out. So we put them on uh, that. But just going to a plant-based diet actually helps relieve a lot of pain. Now, if someone's on codeine and reducing the codeine, the pain will go up because they're not because maybe the problem is worsening, but they're withdrawing from the coating. And so that process of weaning coating will have to take its course. But consuming a raw, natural, plant-based diet helps that along. And treating you know, the underlying cause of the pain helps it as well. Last question, way up in the cup corner over there. So my question is kind of based, I guess you might have answered it. Um, the question is, do you do, uh, do you believe in supplements like uh, herbalist stuff? I know that at some point I've been to herbalist and they'll say, like, take your regular medicine in the morning and just take vitamins and stuff in the evening to not do it together. Because if you go to a normal doctor, they'll say, well, that might interfere with your medicine, so I don't want you to take it. But the herb and more the prevention than the actual medicine is. Yeah. So I guess my question is, yeah, what, what do you, how do you feel about herbs and supplements and stuff like that, or even just like take chlorophyll in the morning or anything? So the, the question about herbs and supplements, I'm not a fan of herbs and supplements because they're not whole foods. Now, there's some exceptions to this. You know, in our society, we are a sanitary society and we do a lot of work inside. So we're not outside and so our vitamin D levels are low. So you, oftentimes you have to supplement vitamin D. I'll measure your levels to make sure it's low or near low to what before I supplement. That's one. B12, uh, the body doesn't make, our gut flora makes. Now, in the ideal scenario, if we're living outside and working outside and farming and doing things and, and communing with the earth and have the ideal, you know, uh, biology and the ideal ecosystem, then we should have the adequate number of bacteria to make adequate B12. We should have adequate vitamin D production from our sunlight. But we don't live in that ideal situation. So the exception of the supplements we often make is B12 and vitamin D on an as-needed basis. But the reason why supplementation and isolated molecules are not ideal, and, and uh, I think Nelson mentioned this that book, Whole, I, I strongly recommend reading that. Uh, in Whole, he talks about an experiment that one of his colleagues does, did, where uh, he took vitamin C. The colleague actually took cancer cells in a Petri dish, and they had a certain amount of vitamin C, one in supplement form, one in the form of an apple. So the apple form of vitamin C against the cancer, supplement form of vitamin C. The cancer was killed by the vitamin C in the context of the apple, but nothing happened in the context of the supplement. The body is infinitely complex. And so if you take a molecule in isolation and look at it, that molecule is a different molecule than when it exists in nature. In the context of a constellation of many other molecules 
There's a certain stoichiometry of it. There's a certain pH, certain environmental factors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you take the complexity of that and then add it to the complexity of the human body and the complexity of the interaction of those two things that is far beyond the scale beyond what we can understand. So it, it's really arrogant of us to say, oh, a carrot has vitamin A or vitamin C or whatever. I'll take those things in isolation and give it and assume that we're doing the same thing. The body doesn't recognize carrots. It doesn't recognize protein. doesn't recognize carbohydrates. doesn't recognize it. It recognizes food. If you eat a carrot, it says, here comes carrot. Eat a broccoli, here comes broccoli. Eat kale, here comes kale. Eat a piece of baked chicken, here comes trouble. The body <laughs> recognizes food in its totality, and there's a complexity of that interaction that we don't understand. So supplementation doesn't get to that, so we need to minimize supplementation and avoid it if, if possible. That's one. Also, supplementation can be problematic. Now, we assume that if you give a supplement vitamin X, Y, or Z, that it has no effect. But it might have an effect which could be adverse. And there's data suggesting calcium supplementation increases a risk of heart attack in women. And there are other adverse and supplementations in, 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 in people that there met, there's some data that suggests it has an adverse effect. So it's not, you know, a, 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 an easy ticket. So be careful with supplementation. We need to thank Dr. Baxter, Baxter Montgomery. Thank you.